That's where we'll be this morning for our, our exposition. It's tremendous to meet you. If you're a visitor, we're glad that you're here. If you're a uh, regular at Hope, then praise God to be in the house of the Lord and under the uh, sound of His Word. What a privilege, amen? amen? His Word comes to us in 1 Timothy 4, instructing us today about the theme of godliness. Godliness. Godliness of the church members, that's you, Godliness of the church congregation, godliness of the ordinary Christians is the true power of a local church. It is not enough that there is one or two um, uh, spirit-filled, obedient people in the church. It's not enough that the pastor is, is uh, 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 experiential and zealous and filled with the spirit. Really, what God does when he wants to enact a great work in his kingdom and for his kingdom is that he, yes, uses leaders, but through them equips the saints. That is, that the, the ministry of a pastor and the eldership, we see this in Ephesians 4, Paul tells them that the way that Jesus works is use the ministers, use the paid pastors, use the elders, use the, uh, uh, those in office in order to equip and strengthen the broader body so that all of us, every one of us, is a member or an organ in the body of the local church doing our work and ministry. And it is through the general ranks of God's army that His great kingdom work is done. And what is vital for that, what is essential, is not just zeal, and is not just high hopes and expectancy, but is a knowledge-informed godliness. The congregation needs to be godly. I'll, I'll start with a working definition of godliness for us so that we can uh, sort of be on the same page. By godliness, I don't mean uh, the quiet guy with the big long tie who stands in the corner and doesn't talk to many people. I don't mean the gal who watches you know, whatever on the prairie that, uh, uh, that movie was and reads Jane Austen's and speaks in these and thous. They do what you want. Sounds entertaining. Godly often sort of has this pietistic, uh, disconnected from the real world, not very approachable, um, a very solemn, sunken brow kind of vibe in our, in our day. Godliness is not merely, it's not, an it's not really even an attitude or an emotion or a personality type. Godliness, here's our working definition. Godliness is holy fruitful ambition, holy, fruitful, rather, let me say this, holy, fruitful labor, holy, fruitful labor. That's what godliness is. Godliness is holy because it's righteous. Godliness is, is laborious because it puts our hands and our hearts and our, and our lives into action. And it is fruitful because we're on a great commission and we seek to see actual souls saved and churches built. Amen. Someone. So I, I take this uh, definition of godliness, that is what should mark every true Christian, I take this from the writings of Paul when he was in prison in the book of Philippians. He wrote to the Philippians and said, look, I'm in prison, maybe I die, I'm not sad. I would love to see Jesus, that's everybody's Monday morning, amen? Look, Jesus, if you take me, I'll see you very soon with a massive smile. I will stay if you want me to, but please know I'd love to see you in person and do away with suffering and sin and folly. But he wrote to the Philippians and said, Now, Jesus might kill me, and I am open to that. But if I stay, it is for your sake that I might do fruitful labor. That then becomes really, when we ask Paul, why are you alive? Why is any Christian alive? He says, why has Jesus not zipped me up through the sky or killed me by the sword and then taken my soul to him? Why are you not dead yet, Christian? Because God has ordained for you good works beforehand for you to walk in. Because God has ordained fruitful labor. You're not a bench sitter. There ought to be no bench sitters in Christ's kingdom. The, the ones who aren't doing any good for the kingdom are the ones worshiping Jesus in heaven. They're not sinning. They're doing great things. Not building the church. The saints are not answering your prayers. Sorry, little Catholic auntie that taught you that. There's no, the saints are doing nothing for us. Jesus is. The retired saints, the bench-sitting saints, are now in just worship and devotion. They're in heaven. Saints on earth, theologians throughout history have called us the church militant. In heaven, we're the church triumphant. We've overcome the world, sin, Satan, death. We are finally in heaven, never to sin again. But while on earth, we are the church militant. We are marching. We are moving. And so fruitful labor, holy, fruitful labor needs to mark every single Christian's life. Archibald G. Brown was a contemporary of Charles Spurgeon. He preached in London also. And he spoke to this matter, talking about churches that are alive, not just with a good preacher, not just with a few good members, not just with a great building. Listen to what he says. 
says, our churches do not need cleverer or better ministers, but revived ones. Our churches, our ministers do not need richer or more respectable buildings, but revived ones. Have a revived pastor and a revived people and no building will be too large for the congregation that will gather. All instrumentality is nothing without the Holy Spirit. But the poorest instrumentality, that's me, the poorest instrumentality with the Spirit is mighty enough to accomplish anything. Alas, what an amount of powerless machinery we have in so-called evangelicalism today. Powerless because it has no unction. Powerless because it is the work of man, not the working of God through man. Powerless because it's dry and artificial. Powerless because it's done by men who have never tarried in prayer until they are endued with power from on high. Instrumentality is almost worshipped. Systems and programs are worshipped while the Holy Spirit is well near ignored. What he said then could be said a thousand times over and over in our day today. We don't need more systems, more programs, bigger buildings. We need people, and I'm preaching to you. We need the general ranks of God's army to be revived unto godliness. Real, vital godliness that submits to God's word and seeks to obey him in all areas of life. This is the danger and this is the problem of what had occurred to the Ephesian church. Paul had been there and planted an amazingly thriving mega church, souls being saved, bankrupting the the temples and the black magic arts of all of their worshippers and bringing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. But in his absence, Ephesus had become artificial and dry, to use Archibald's words. It had become reliant upon machinery of man and not upon the Holy Spirit. It had become fruitless because it had redefined its purpose for existence. We read here uh, in, in the book of 1 Timothy, we can understand that they had allow, the, the members of the church had allowed their consciences to be dirtied. They were tolerating sin in their life. They had, some of them had seared consciences that the devil was able to use to introduce error and inject lies and demonic teaching into the congregation through them. They'd been listening to liars from the pulpits who taught these doctrines of demons we learnt last week so that the gospel proclamation was replaced with Old Testament law requirements. We see that in chapter 1. So that godly male leadership was replaced with ungodly leadership or immodest female leadership. We saw that in chapter 2. Freedom had been replaced with legalism about what you should eat, what you're allowed to eat, whether you should marry, you should probably stay single, sex is evil. That was in chapter 4. Instead of creating a godly, wonderful, thriving culture where people are getting married, having kids, discipling them, inviting each other over for dinners, having feasts, worshipping Jesus, evangelizing, coming to church, celebrating, they had this dry, legalistic, dying church. Ultimately, they had replaced the mission of God, which chapter 1 tells us, the reason for which Christ came into the world. They, as a church, had replaced the mission of God which is saving sinners, they'd replace that with being a museum of God showcasing saints. Look at how holy we are. We don't eat red meat. Look at how holy we are. We dabble in some Old Testament law code. Look at how holy we are. We have a legacy. You know, some churches are still like this today. Many churches are still like this today. They have enormous churches. They have a big picture of the founding pastor under whom there was revival. They have the same schedule of sermons or preaching or prayer meetings or Bible studies. You're not allowed to move the pews because that's where they were sitting when revival struck. We had the amazing sending of missionaries. But This is the 1930s. This was a crazy time. It was amazing. Uh, Missionaries were going out. Souls were being saved. More churches were being planted. We we extended that wall uh, because we, we needed to fit so many more people in here. This was an amazing church. We have a legacy and a heritage and a history. And it means nothing. Because Ephesus had that and better. And she received some of the harshest rebukes against any church in the New Testament. Jesus speaks to her and says, repent, return to the works you did at first, or I will close you down. The Ephesian church had become dangerous and in fact damaging to the kingdom of God. Because as long as this mega church with this huge building in the hall of Tyrannus 
and this huge legacy of revival. And Pastor Paul, the Apostle Paul planted it, and Peter came through here, and, and Pastor John, he, he was here as well. As long as they had this big, impressive memorial folder of all the glory days and lots of traditions that they had handed down, as long as they had those, other Christians thought, I probably don't need to evangelize Ephesus, they got it. Other Christians thought, I probably don't need to be a missionary to Ephesus. There's a big church there. All the while, that church is not reaching out and saving sinners. All the while, that church is propagating demonic teachings like feminism and legalism. And so this church earned its harsh rebuke and it earned the sending of Timothy by Paul to correct the errors that were there. And by God's grace, we see... The, 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 uh, the, the commands and the exhortations given to Timothy today are for our blessing as well. Here's a basic summary of what we're going to see in this text. Chap- in chapter 4, 6 through 11, Timothy is commanded to teach the truth, to be trained in the truth, and to not veer from the truth. And in doing so, he will train himself and the congregation, he will train himself and the church that he is leading into godliness, which is holy Fruitful labor. Holy, fruitful labor is our aim today. Let's read the text. Chapter 4, verse 6. If, Timothy, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. May God bless the words of Paul, the words of the Holy Spirit, the words of the risen and reigning Jesus Christ in our midst to our blessing this morning. First, we understand Timothy was told to teach the truth in order that he and the congregation might be trained in godliness so that the church would be known for its holy, fruitful labor. Truth to bring about godliness for holy, fruitful labor In the church, Timothy, uh, uh, we see here, receives the first command because godliness in a church starts with the minister. We started by saying godliness in the pews is the power and strength of a church because one holy man in the pulpit can't carry every ministry that needs to be done to our dying world. Nonetheless, godliness in the pews starts with godliness in the pulpit, it starts with godliness in leadership by example, by instruction. It's a heavy duty. Timothy is told here, First Timothy, if you want them to be holy, you want them to be godly, you want them to re-engage in the Great Commission, you want them to repent, you want them to put back in order what is out of place, then put these things before them. What is these things? What is it that he is meant to put in front of them? The thing that he needs to put in front of them is the teachings that Paul just told to us in chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. He said, put what I've just told to you Serve up to the brothers. That brothers is just word for the family, the siblings. The, the, the men and women are included here. But it's as if the picture that Paul is using in that word, he says, put these before them, is really the language of a, a waiter coming and delivering you the food that the chef has cooked. It's an important relationship in this word, word picture. That a pastor and a faithful pastor, a good servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, or a good minister, or a good waiter, or a good deacon, we could say, is the same word, A good minister of God, of Jesus Christ, doesn't meddle with the food that he has cooked for his flock. Right? The pastor does not receive the word from Scripture. Sort of flick off the beans, get rid of the corn, take off the red meat, they're not ready for that, and deliver up mashed potato and ice cream. He doesn't come and take this and go, oh, wow, that's insensitive. That's culturally uh, probably just specific to back then. That'll get me in trouble. They won't donate to the church fund if I say that. Here's your wet potato and ice cream, oh, church. Be fed. Can't happen. If the godliness of the congregation is going to thrive, the flock needs a shepherd that will feed them. 
Feed them what God cooked up, not him. If, if the, 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 the task force of the church is going to be productive, they're going to need a foreman in the pulpit who is task-oriented and himself staying on the mission of Christ. So the first thing that he needs to do to have a godly church is to exemplify godliness himself, which includes and starts with telling the church what Jesus told him through Paul. Which, if you go and look back at what he just said, it's informing the church. Now, have you been in a church where, that was dying and didn't know it? Have you ever been there? I've been there. You've been there in a church and people are, people are just like the, the congregation's shrinking, money's going down, people are divisive, uh, families are breaking down, sin is everywhere, the pastors aren't preaching the word and they're up here going, oh, we're just so amazed with what God's doing in our midst. Next week we're going to start a series on, on Jesus and the cinema. Who's keen? They have fake laugh tracks and applause tracks up the back and they keep the lights down real low so you can't tell that there's no one in here. <clears throat> Dying churches often don't know that they're dying, we know that, but, but then when, when a minister comes in to try and change things, so I just swore, didn't I? I just said the, the word you're not allowed to say in churches, change. And you know this because most of you are sitting where exactly where you sat last week and the week before and the week before, and I bet if we put four columns instead of three at church, somebody would tap me on the shoulder and why we've started to compromise on the truth of the gospel. That's what, <laughs> that's what would happen. Let alone carpet change color, or if this pulpit was just maybe, and maybe I'll test you. Maybe we'll just move it over here. The team can sing over there. You've wondered why we've drifted left, right? You go, this is, this is deadly. Churches despise change despise, even when it is the most essential, important thing for them to survive. And what I'm saying is, Timothy as a young man is coming into a huge church with feminists in the pulpit and angry people in the congregation and men who are failing to lead their families. And his job is to tell them, men, get a job, lead your family, women, shush, and then he's dodging stools, right? He's dodging the clubs and the rocks that are going to be thrown at him. That's a hard job. That's why he's been told... You will be a good servant of Jesus if you faithfully discharge what you've been told and inform the church that their traditions and the way that they do things was invented by Satan. That's why no one's getting involved. That's why no one's getting saved. It's the doctrines of demons. You're sinners. You've been tolerating sin because you have the laurels of an effective and fruitful past in your church. So you've been sitting on that. You've tolerated sin. Lies have come in. Heretics are in the pulpit. People aren't getting saved. Jesus is about to threaten us in the book of Revelation that he's going to close this church down because of you. Repent or see the church die. That's Timothy's job. He's got a hard job. Therefore, godliness would be evident in him by delivering to the saints what Jesus had said. He's aiming at godliness, godliness. And, and, and if you just say that word, hey, Christian, are you godly? Most Christians will say, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm pretty godly. You need to define godliness because different churches will, will, will sort of push at different sort of overarching missions. And that's why I'm camping on this explicit definition of holy fruitful labor in the Great Commission. That is seeing souls saved, churches planted, churches grown, saints needs met, right? The Great Commission. Because Paul had just told Timothy last week, last passage, that the form of godliness that Ephesus was pursuing was in fact demonic teaching. Because they were imbibing Old Testament law codes. They were inventing laws about not getting married because sex is evil. They were inventing things about not eating certain foods because some of it's not created by God. The demon God made that stuff. And so they were all for godliness as long as that godliness was not biblically defined. And one of the temptations, I see it in the New Testament. I see it when I read church history in the early fathers. I see it when I read medieval history and in Catholicism. I see it when I read, read Reformation, post-Reformation. It's the, the superstition is natural to everybody's heart, including Christians. We are naturally superstitious. Oh, if I don't touch that, do that. If I do this, maybe then God will do this. Like maybe I'll be closer to God if I, I know the words there, but the Bible doesn't tell me everything. Maybe I just invent these little rules for myself. And try, we're all naturally superstitious. And so let me just read, on the basis of what I see all throughout 1 Timothy, I'm sort of going to apply it to a hope, a hope context, the sorts of things that actually embody godliness. Because it's not floating and speaking with angels' tongues, and it's not avoiding certain foods. It's stuff like this. 
Real godliness in a congregation is spiritual yet earthy, and it manifests like women keeping their homes for their husbands and children despite the difficulty. Men working hard for their wives and children despite the difficulty. Parents leading their children through all of the mess and chaos in devotions and family worship. Young couples working together to build a life to serve God and build his kingdom. People in the congregation opening up their homes with all the cleaning and all the clutter removal that it takes to be able to have people in their home for a Bible study, a fellowship meal, a time of prayer. Men, often young men, in the church preparing studies after hours, early mornings, late at nights, taking sermon notes from Pastor Tom, trying to put Bible studies together uh, and utilize those so that there would be a meaty time of discussion at the midweek Bible studies. Picnics and outreach events to our community. Christian men and women building Christian businesses and places of education in our community. Trainees and students, maybe that's you, apprentices and university students, faithfully undergoing assessments and going through graduation in prayerful preparation for a life that will be useful to God. Budgeting, just sitting down and budgeting money, looking at the calendar, looking at the budget, moving money around in order to be able to give to the kingdom. Generosity to people in need who can't pay back. Making and keeping marriage vows together. Doing evangelism in the street. Handing tracts out. Speaking the gospel to strangers. These things are what holy, fruitful labor looks like. This is what it looks like on the ground. And praise God we see much of that. Does any of that describe you? Is that that what is shaping your, your sort of your whole drive and posture in life? Holy, fruitful Labor, godliness on the ground, a really earthy, real, tangible godliness. Timothy is required to teach them this, and in turn, they are required to then embody that godliness. Look at the second thing. Teach them the truth is the first step to a godly congregation. Be trained in the truth, Timothy, is the second application from our text. Look at the end of verse 6. You will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Look at the end of verse 7. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Here's the reason. Because bodily exercise is of value in some ways, but godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Paul is saying, be trained in the truth. You must be, be, be trained actively, intentionally, decisively, decidedly in the truth because our natural inclination is to drift like Ephesus, like many churches, to drift into error, into distraction, into heresy, and then into closure. As an individual, it will look like being drifting into good things, not soul winning, not, not building the church, so much, but, but, you know, family and, and, and work and man's got to make a living and, uh, and we need some holidays too and, and I have a few side hustles and I'll get to church, when, you know, when I'm not busy and, 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 and then God really wants me to be happy actually and this is where I find myself happy, not so much in his commandments but in my desires and, and then, you know what, maybe God's law doesn't matter at all and, and did Jesus rise from the dead? And is it really sinful to have this girlfriend on the side? I'm just not sure. We drift step by step. The, 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 the water that drowns us comes in drip by drip. And so we are told, train. The psalmist says, God trains my hands for war. This is the confession of every Christian. Be trained in the truth. Be brought up. There, there is the word here. Um, uh, uh, There is the relationship here we see of if Timothy is faithful in his teaching, if he is being trained, we can see that this this applies to them because then he's told later, command and teach these things. So the same things that are true for him, I must be trained in the word, I must deliver the truth, will then be embodied in the people. There's a great example from this, from Reformation history. It's a gentleman by the name of Martin Bucer. He was in Strasbourg in uh, 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 France and he was a Catholic... Catholics of Catholic, he was a single priest in training to be able to be uh, high up in the uh, uh, church order. And one time in, I believe it was 1518, Martin Luther, a bull, a hog, a boar of a man, literally the names the Catholics had for him, came into town and started to preach Reformation doctrine of salvation by faith, etc., etc. 
and, and, and the sin of the Catholic Church and the errors of the councils. And, and Martin Bucer was highly offended, so highly offended that his heart was torn open, the seed of the gospel went and he was saved. Because this Timothy type man, Martin, preached the truth, served it up, and he ate and believed. Then it was his turn. He went back to Strasbourg and he was a priest, right? Why didn't he, you know, they didn't have reformed churches yet. He was, he was trying to think about what to do. And, and as he's reading the New Testament, he's listening to the reformers. He goes, we can get married. I read 1 Timothy 4 in the original language. Forbidding marriage is demonic. I'm a finer woman. And so he got married and he got ex. That's, that's an awesome thing to get excommunicated for the, from the church for, getting married to a woman. That's that's when you know you're wrong, uh, when you're, when you're uh, excommunicating people for that. So he marries a woman. They excommunicate him. He says, okay, whatever. I'm no longer Catholic. Neither is this church or this congregation. And he fed up. He, he delivered up and served up the truth of God to them. They ate it up, became a converted, reformed congregation. And there the French Reformation continued. This is how the church has survived so many millennia and so much persecution. That word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. And now forget the rest of the line. <clears throat> the truth of God delivered by the man of God creates people of God who receive the truth of God and implement that in godliness. There is an order to this. So uh, we see that uh, verse 6 says, be trained up in the words of the faith and good doctrine. Then we see in verse 7, he says, exercise yourself in godliness. The, the first word really means nourishment. Be fed and grow upon, feed upon the good words and uh, the good doctrine and the words of the faith. The second word is the word gymnasio, from which we get our word gymnastics or gym, gymnasium. In the Greek world, uh, the gym uh, was, a, was a cultural center. That's where the important men, the strong men, the, the, the uh, up and rising, uh, uh, up and coming shooting stars, they would go to gym, they would show off their prowess. It was a part of Greek culture to embody uh, a, a bodily uh, expertise and, and, and things like that. Um, and so Paul is using that, exercise, that, that's, that imagery, saying, as they train themselves for the Olympics to please their gods in worship, as they strain and they sacrifice and they do without some things and they're up early to exercise in other things for the sake of bodily exercise to please their demon gods so you, pleasing the true and living God, exercise yourself. Gymnasio, get up early and lift the weights of the word. Train your soul in godliness. That's the order. You're nourished on the word. And then the word provides such spiritual nutrients to your body that you can then be trained in to implement and obey. There's a great picture of this, again, historical in the Reformation. There was a man by the name of William Farrell. He was a preacher and an evangelist for the Reformation very early on in the Reformation. He was, he was preaching justification before Martin was even pinning the uh, 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 95 Thesis to the church door. And he was in France, and they didn't like him, the Catholics, so they kicked him out of a certain town. He went to the next town, changed his name under a pseudonym as a good Samaritan, opened up a school for the illiterate. That is, if you don't know your reading and writing, I will teach you for free. What a guy. And as he was thinking about what book he should use to do his teaching, he selected, oh, I don't know, the New Testament. So now he's an undercover preacher, and he's teaching them, and he's training them, and these children are becoming literate, and he says, do your, do your parents know how to read and write? Well, bring them along as well. I'll teach them. And so he had this congregation, which thought they were a class, a congregation being taught the sound words of faith, the good doctrine, the meat of the word of God, the, the gospel of eternal life was being preached to them and taught to them. They're writing it down in their own hand. They're reading it themselves as he's teaching them. Because he had quite a successful school, he applied to the local council for a preaching permit, which they gave to this young man whose name they had not before heard. And upon receiving that, he, I don't know whether they had white out then and he edited the name, but he took his wig off and he go, ha, I'm actually William Farrell, gotcha. And so he started going around that town preaching and declaring the saving grace in Jesus Christ that doesn't require Catholic penance or acts of worship or payments or sacrifices to be saved but a grace that is received by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, who lived for us, died for us, rose again, and now sits in heaven to give salvation for free. 
What a good news that was to preach. But the Catholic, con- the Catholic communities hated it. But they couldn't get to him as he stood up in public. They couldn't physically get to him or throw things far enough because the people who packed out the first few rows of the, the evangelical rock concert, we could say, were all of his congregation. The people who had been taught on the meat of the word. They'd gone, and then before long, that town voted in to abolish the Catholic Mass and declare their city a reformed city based on the Word of God and not the Catholic Church. Illiterate people, no, illiterate children, illiterate adults became God's instrument for turning the tides and turning that town upside down. Why? Because they were nourished, they were fed, they were raised up on the Word of Truth and the Good Doctrine. And then they implemented it in training themselves and preaching godliness. So we must be trained, uh, 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 nourished in the, the, the words of the faith and on the good doctrine. My question for you is, have you been? Are you being outdone by the illiterate French? Don't. All right. Have you been taught and nourished? I'll tell you, there's a way that we structure everything here at Hope Church. None of it is incidental or accidental or taking a guess or going by the traditions of other Baptist churches or whatever. What we do here, we do precisely because a teaching of the truth, which brings about obedience that then brings about fruitful labor, knowing the truth, obeying what you learned, bringing about fruit in the Great Commission. That is the order of the Great Commission. Learn the truth. Obey the truth, see your labor become fruitful in planting churches, raising churches, saving souls, knowing, obeying, fruitful labor. We know that that happens in response to the teaching and the understanding of the Word of God. So I'm asking you, are you engaging intentionally with the uh, ministerial structure of the church that you belong to? Because here we have two sermons every Sunday. I invite you to both, and I don't know why you'd only be going to one unless necessity or family emergencies are keeping you. The Word of God is being preached. The saints are gathering. Christ is meeting us to bless us. If you hate your sin and you're sick of it sticking around, if you despise your lack of knowledge and you want to be more fruitful, praise the Lord. He's given you an answer. See you at 5.30 as well. And so I invite you. I also think in the midweek we have gatherings of Bible set, not group chats, not fellowship hangs. Not kumbayas, Bible studies. Say it with me, Bible studies. Open it, get this, this this stuff should sell. You open the Bible, you look at what it says, you talk about it, and you understand its truth. Can you imagine if churches did that? Anyway, uh, midweek Bible studies, and this is what I told the 8.30, you're allowed to go to as many as you want. So I'm just freeing up your conscience, yes. Yes, you may go to them all. If you so desire, I encourage you to go at least to one. Uh, are you seeking the, uh, 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 the meat of doctrine and the words of faith that might come from good books? And maybe you say, I don't know where to start. Please, if it's been more than six months uh, uh, since you've sat down with one of the elders, just hit us up, send us a message, grab us afterwards and say, uh, give me something to read. Uh, point me in a certain direction. Uh, what, how might I be more nourished and more trained and exercised in the words of faith and the good doctrine so that I can be fruitful, labor in a holy way in my life? I want to be godly. Please do that. We're here for that. That's what shepherds are here for. I ask you, are you doing this? Paul does acknowledge... Paul does acknowledge there is some benefit, right, before the gym junkies start getting all testosterone up and start flooding the stage to beat me up, you would win. Uh, He does acknowledge there is some value in physical ability and health and fitness. We should all know that. We're going to be more productive, uh, able to enjoy our day, less tired, less fatigued, all of that if we are at physical peak, and some of us have known what it's been like to be physically peak, and no longer at physical peak or through injury or through just time or through lack of discipline. We lack that. You feel in your body and yourself and your energy levels, oh, that I could get back to that. Paul, that is valuable. There is value in that and good. However, the value from physical exercise terminates on your gravestone. There's not a single cell 
stretched and grown in your muscle fibers. There's, there's not a single element of your cardiac health. There's no brain fog clarity that you've gotten from your great mineral thing that you found online. There's no benefit from keto or carnivore or seafood diet, whatever it is. There's no benefit that will go with you beyond the grave. None. Unless that exercise is being done in such a way as to avail yourself, your ability, your body, your productivity for godliness. So, so bodily training has some value in this life, zero value. Did I say godliness? Bodily training has some value in this life, zero value for the next life. Godliness, as you strain yourself to do that, if you're going to the gym early in the morning and you're not reading your Bible, you need to cancel your membership and reorder your priorities. If, if we are godly, we have discipline, uh, sorry, we have blessing in this life from godliness and blessing in the next life. It is more blessed to be godly than fit uh, in this life, and it is infinitely better to be godly because of the life that is to come. Because if we are godly, and that is we are pursuing holy, fruitful labor, then we are working with God in his ultimate mission on earth. We are being used for his purposes to establish and extend and uh, spread the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there is no limit to the benefit of godliness. There is, there is benefit, but there is limit to the benefit of exercise. Pursue it, enjoy those benefits. There is no limit to the benefit of godliness. Every situation you find yourself in, you will have a double joy because you have a clean conscience and a godly life. Even your sorrows are half sorrows if you are godly because you are doing it with a clean conscience and you are directed for the Great Commission. And you know you're not under God's frown. You're under his smile, but he's sending you difficulties. Godliness touches every area of your life. There was another circumstance in William Farrell's life which exemplifies this. That is, that shows that in this moment in his life, godliness was of more value than superior strength exercising in fitness. Here's what had happened. There was another French town called Orbe, and it was in some, some uh, conflict over the Reformation. Should we? Uh, European Reformation was very political. They, they would vote in councils. Will we side with the Reformed or will we side with the Catholics? Who do we allow to teach the people in the churches? And this town was, was, was conflicted. And so the Catholics were sending in their missionaries and their best preachers, and the Reformed were sending in their missionaries and their best preachers. But the Reformed only had pubs and taverns, and fields to meet in. Because the Catholics, with their security guards and very angry mobs, held the cathedrals. With the thousands upon thousands of people that could flood into the cathedrals with a pulpit. And so, eventually, the reformers sent in a firebrand, a known strategist by the name of William Farrell. But no one else had had the guts to just march into a Catholic church and stand in a pulpit. But no one had tried it. So William Farrell thought... Hadn't been tried, may as well try it. And he rocks up to the city, and instead of going to the pub or the tavern or the street or the, or the, or, or, or the field, he goes into the main... <laughs> I love the goal on this guy. He goes into the main Catholic cathedral, walks past people, up into the pulpit, invites his followers in, and starts preaching the Reformed doctrine of the true gospel in Jesus Christ alone. It is not long before... This is why no one had tried it. It was not long before... A gang surrounded him, tore him down out of that stony pulpit and started to beat him with blows with their clubs. The city bailiff, that is the police basically, had to intervene. They saved his life and they told him, here's the councils, you know, they said, let's make it equal for Catholics and for Protestants. Let's, let's give them a fair hearing. Bloodied, beaten, nearly disabled Pharrell, you have the next month to preach every day if you want in the pulpits, for your cause. There is no level of bodily exercise and training that he could have done to be perfectly healthy as a gang of men come with clubs to beat him. But his godliness was untouched and fitter than ever. So that bruised, beaten, spitting out teeth, limping, he could stand up in the pulpit with a swollen tongue and preach every day for multiple hours of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Body failing, godliness shining. So I wonder, you're likely not going to be beaten up by a gang as you leave here. 
and then invited to preach daily in the Brisbane Council building. Unlikely. But if you were, is your godliness in such a well-trained, peak physique setting, is it, is it, is it, is it well-trained enough that you would even be able to come up with 30 texts to preach over the next month? Like if that opportunity availed itself to you, would you be well-trained enough to take it? This is where training in godliness prepares us for the worst, gets us through the worst, prepares us for the grandest of missionary uh, opportunities that God may give. Godliness, godliness, godliness in your life. I agree with Archibald before, a revived church who knows vital godliness. If a church is like that, there's no building you can build that is big enough for the people that God might bring to be saved and become an army for the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Godliness must be taught by the pastor. It must be handed before the brothers. It must be trained in the pastor after being nourished upon it, and that must be commanded and taught, verse 11 says, to the people as well. Nourished on and trained in good faith and good doctrine. And lastly, the way that we ensure godliness in a church is we do not veer from the truth. The pastor needs to preach the truth, the pastor and the people need to be trained in the truth, and everybody needs to make sure we do not veer from the truth. Look at verse 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. The problem of myths and errors, as we saw in chapter 1, is that they distract the church, they make her less effective, and instead of scoping out the enemy, the snipers and the tank aimers start seeing cute birds on the horizon and start watching nice planets and go, wow, look at how far you can see with these binoculars while the enemy's advancing. Irreverent, silly myths are stupid ideas that don't have any impact for the Great Commission. Here's a good thing, just for you, in your mind, as you're about to start an argument with somebody online, right, in the Facebook comments, the holiest of all places, <laughs> next to YouTube comments, before you engage, before you spark up that disagreement with another Christian, maybe in this church, maybe just somebody you meet on the street, before you invest energy into delving into, to understand and read the books that are being suggested, ask yourself this question. If I did this, would the kingdom be moved forward at all? Would this even help the strength and the unity and the missional focus of my local church? Not nah. super interesting though, then even if it's not heretical, it's already an irrelevant silly myth for you. Just talking to somebody after this, after our last service, preached the sermon. So somebody asked it, a zealous, um, earnest young man who, who asked, I've, I, I've engaged with, with, with somebody who, they used to come to this church years back. They used to come to this church. They're now Catholic. And I'm writing a discourse to convince him how he's wrong. My answer, irreverent and silly myths have been swallowed. Don't try. He's an online person to you. Leave it. Whatever energy you would have put into that, Focus it on something in the local church. Find a brother to love, a sister to help, a, a ministry to fulfill. Do something more useful. I, I think this is why, I know, this is why divine godliness was fruitful labor. Fruitful, not fruitless, not, not, not merely scratching our intellectual, our intellectual itches, but genuine fruitful work that produces a harvest for Jesus. Holy, fruitful labor. Do not veer from the truth. You know, some of you might think, oh, how do we know, though? Like, there's so many weird opinions out there. Uh, uh, can you give us a list, like just a working, running list of all the dumb ideas and the myths that are out there, and then we'll avoid them? No, I can't. I cannot. Neither does Paul, though. Paul doesn't actually make a big list. In first, there's an appendix, 1 Timothy chapter 7, and it's all the dumb things to avoid. You know what he does continually? Sets out the truth, preaches the truth, says, chase after that. If you're focused on that, you will be able to tell the silly errors as they come. You'll be able to sort of shush them off and leave the dead weights behind because those aren't helpful for mission, so it's not from God. 
Those aren't clarifying of doctrinal scriptural teachings. These aren't in alignment with the gospel of the glory of God, chapter 1. These aren't the words of the faith or sound doctrine, chapter 4. These are legalistic and therefore demonic, chapter 4. This is confusing of God's clear commands, chapter 2 and 3. We simply say, this is not helpful. I will leave it behind. It's a silly, irreverent myth. And to close out, we'll look at this final motivation that Paul gives to us in verse 9 and 10. Look at verse 9. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. He said this multiple times. He says this as a, uh, this makes a great fridge, fridge magnet, is in other words what he's saying. Right? This makes a great bumper sticker for Christianity. Don't really go and get one, waste of time. But this is, like, this is one of those memory verses that we should have. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Here's what he's saying. Look at how verse 8 ends. Godliness is in value of every way, because it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. Do you want to live a Christian life where when you're dead, whether they remember you or not, you and Jesus can look back over every page of your life and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. The kingdom was extended. Souls were saved. Jesus was glorified because of your faithful labor by the grace and empowerment of God. It's a dumb question, but Christian, do you want that? Do you want to genuinely get to judgment day and have a plethora of rewards because there is so much fruit left behind you and souls just keep on dying and going to heaven who you preach to in your life? Do you want that? And if you do want that, if you don't want the godliness that produces promise now and promise then, a fruitful life now, a rewarded eternal life then, if you want that, then this is what Paul is saying. This is how we get it. To this end, we toil and strive. To a blessed life, to a rewarded life. To a, productive, to a productive life now and a rewarded life then, to this end we toil and strive, having our hope set on the living God who is the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. The word especially, it could otherwise be translated in other words. God is the saviour of all people. In other words, those who believe. Jesus died for all people, chapter 2 told us. That is those that God has elected. Jesus is the saviour of all sinners, that is those who come to him by faith. God is the saviour of all people, those who believe. In other words, he's saying this, God's a living God. He's not some dead, dumb, demonic Diana in the Artemis temple in Ephesus. God's a real, living, active God, and look around, he's saving people. He's saving people right now, and you can join that and have a blessed life now in that mission, and a rewarded life then because of the mission if you toil and strive to prioritize kingdom advancement in your holy, productive labor. That's the life that Paul is promising. Not some health, wealth, no sickness, no difficulties, no persecution. He's not promising that. He's promising a, re a, a fruitful life and a rewarded eternal life if, as a Christian, you strain yourself you train yourself to know the truth, to obey the truth, and trust God for abundant harvest through your life and godliness. This will be the strength of any church. To those among us who are not actually Christians, however, a straining for godliness is futile. It's like, it's like pumping the gas as hard as you can. The revs searing up over 7,000 RPM and you have no wheels. You don't have the first thing that actually enables godliness, which is a new, clean heart given by Jesus Christ alone. So you can't be godly. Please don't try. In fact, what you have is, is probably something akin to what he said in verse 7 and 8, that, that you're banking on when judgment day comes, when Jesus comes back, when I see God, I'm taking refuge in something. And maybe for you, like the Greeks... It's an idea of your bodily prowess. I'm pretty fit. I'm okay. I'm, a good, I'm not going to go to hell. I'm not going to die. You, you lie to yourself that you don't have to think about waking up in hell tomorrow because you have a great cardiac health. You can run 40 miles and all the rest. You look after yourself. Death isn't something. You're 20. You're 17. You're 14. You don't die. Old people die. 
Or you're old and you think, I've had a good life, I've lived a good, I'm a good person, I'm a good citizen, I've never murdered anybody, I've stolen very little, mostly from the government, I'm a good person. Maybe you look on your religious work, you think, I've gone to church often, I've, uh, I've seen great things happen, uh, I've been a member for a long time, I helped build that wall back in the days of the early revival. I don't know what your heart might superstitiously be banking on to try and flee from the wrath of God on that final day, but I'm telling you, Unless it is Jesus Christ alone, it is an empty hope and it will fail you. Riches won't save you. Health won't keep you alive forever. Nothing, no good works that you've ever done or religious deeds will ever help take away an ounce of God's wrath that will pour down on you on that day. The only refuge given to us, the only shelter that we need to get under is Jesus Christ who came into the world and lived a perfect life for you because you can't, who died on the cross to pay for your sins, which you are going to have to go to hell forever to pay for. And then he rose triumphantly and victoriously to provide a refuge for all those who come to God in faith. God is the savior of all people who believe. Merely believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Flee from your silly refuges, your, your silly attempts, your, 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 your vain hopes of being healthy and not going to die soon. Throw those away. You could be dead by the end of this sermon, but rest on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be secure in him before you breathe your next breath. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for the words that Paul wrote in this letter to Timothy. In a broader sense, it's a letter to every pastor. It's a letter to every church. It's a letter to every Christian that we must train ourselves for godliness. Father God, we thank you for the mercy above all mercies that in our ungodliness, Jesus died for us. That in our ungodliness, you sent your son to be the savior of sinners. We thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to give us a new and a godly heart. We pray, Lord God, that it would not only be our new nature, It would not only be the word's commands, and it would not only be our deep desires to be godly, but that you would truly shape us by your word, conform us by your Holy Spirit to be people who, like Paul, can say that I worked harder than I knew how, and it was the the work of God's grace within me. Please, God, make this church a hard-working, laborious, striving, great commission-engaged church. Make us fruitful, with a wonderful harvest behind us, not for our glory or for our name, but all for Christ's glory. Let us be forgotten, but use us to spread your kingdom, O God. And before we can, answer, we can receive an answer to that prayer, we must receive an answer to this in light of your word today. Please make us repentant. Please make us holy. Please make us staying away from idleness and distraction. Make us committed, nourished on, trained by the words of truth and exercised in good doctrine. Father God, please do this in our midst, and please, right now, give your gracious life through the Lord Jesus Christ to those who don't yet believe. Please bring them in. Please save them. Please forgive them. Please have mercy on them. We pray all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said...